All right, one of the things that I'm hearing from people is that they're having trouble doing the reading. And a lot of that is not because the readings are too difficult or because people are dumb, but simply because it's a different kind of reading than most people are used to reading. When you're reading for something <clears throat> in education, you're looking for procedure, for facts, for things you spit back, because you're going to have to do it that way, or else the school district is not going to be happy with you. If you are reading in criminal justice or in human services, you're also looking for procedures. Your readings may be a little bit shorter, and the context is usually the modern world. So even when you're trying to figure out what somebody said, you're able to do it because you're not also having to deal with a strange context. But when you're reading for history, you've got something else entirely. Or, in fact, when you're reading for communication or sociology or even English or anything in the liberal arts, you're often looking for argument and how all of this material fits together. Instead of being told, here is this person and this is what they want you to remember, you're given a whole set of pages, much longer than you're used to, and, and told, make sense out of it. <clears throat> well, that isn't always something that anyone's been taught to do. So let's figure out, the first thing you need to do is really revise a reading strategy. And what I see most students doing is this one. They read from the start to the finish, and they just go straight forward. And in the book, they're zoning in on names. They're zoning in on dates. They're zoning in on facts. But these things are just floating out there. There's nothing that binds them together. There's nothing that helps you make sense. And so what you do if you're using this reading strategy is you wind up with confusion because you've got all of these things together and you're thinking, okay, now what do I do? Well, usually what happens is you get told look for argument. And of course that's the way we want you to read in history and in the social sciences and in liberal studies in general. Because remember what Lindbergh said at the beginning of the text, or rather that he wrote because he didn't actually say it, um, that people have seen the past in many different ways and the idea that we get from it is often determined by the question that we ask. There is no one thing that happened in the past. And as I said in my podcast, we only know 10% of the past, and so the image that I get from it might be different from the one you get from it, although broadly similar. For example, look at this past week's readings with Lindbergh looking at the institutional church across Europe and coming to the conclusion that there were many problems that were alienating people and were making Europe ripe for a reformation. Duffy, on the other hand, Eamon Duffy, was looking at one particular area within the church, its educational program, and its sense of community, and was saying, well, at least in England, it was actually doing a pretty good job. Not only that, but people were engaged, they were interested, and when the church didn't come up to their ideas of what should happen, they told the church so. And so you get two very different pictures there. Duffy is saying, well, if you just look at people's everyday experience, the Reformation was not inevitable. So how do you figure out argument? That's the big question. Let's go ahead and start thinking about reading strategy and if 
this is going to fit you. Have you ever been told in your papers that you need to pay more attention to transitions? Well, believe it or not, how you write says a lot about how you read. And if you don't write solid transitions, if you just, you know, if you clump these facts together and then another topic, you clump those facts together, or your transitions are minimal, you know, another thing we think about is, yet another thing he said was, um, then basically you're writing them, but you're not really using them. And transitions are absolutely useful, and if you're reading for argument, they are critical. Paragraphs are like sandwiches. The transition is the bread, and with maybe a little bit of mayo to bind everything together. What that means is that the paragraph begins with a transition that links what the author's next topic is, both to what the author was saying in the previous paragraph, but also often to what the author is doing with the entire chapter. And so because of that, you have to pay attention to those transitions. The middle is just the filling. Those are the facts. Those are the support. But like a sandwich isn't easy to eat if you don't have the bread, um, the, it, it's hard to make sense out of all of those names and dates and facts if you don't know why they're there. What story is being told? What does the author need you to understand? And so because of that, you really have to focus, when I read, on transition to the next transition. Then I go back and I look at the middle once I know why the author wants me to look at that. Okay, let's take a look at our text. And I'm going to use the Google Books version of our textbook, which means, unfortunately, that we have got missing pages, but at least it, there will be enough there to get the point across. So let's say that I am reading one of the things that we assigned for last week, which would be the implementation of the reforms in Wittenberg, Chapter 4. Now, the first thing that I do is, as a historian, I'm looking for several things. Change over time. I'm looking for, um, you know, I'm looking for... Um, an idea that has an effect, but basically there's going to be something caused something or something changed to something else. And basically, here, I'm looking at this text and I'm seeing the chapter itself is Wait for No One, Implementation of Reforms in Wittenberg. So I'm already thinking here, all right, this is going to be a somebody took action and there was a result. And so because it's implementation of reforms, that means before reform and after. So I already know what I'm looking at. And all right, so I'm going to move forward a little bit. I'm still not sure about this interface, so forgive the kind of weird uh, stuff. Let me see if I can erase my um, before and after here. And looks like I can't, so let's just keep going. So the first thing I do is I begin at the beginning, but I don't just keep going. I look at what is going on and the first thing I notice is that Lindbergh likes to give us a kind of a human interest picture. He always starts with a story or an incident that we can grab hold of, but that is going to exemplify either his starting point or the entire chapter. In this case, 
safely perched in the Wartburg Castle overlooking his land of the birds, Luther began work on making the new song of the gospel accessible to the people. Um, so, in other words, remember that he's been um, spirited away for his own safety and he's got nothing else to do, and so he's continuing to make this translation of the Bible for everybody. And so, on the one hand, then um, Lindbergh actually immediately gives us the significance. Um, his German translation was an intensely academic um, labor, but it was also um, potentially as revolutionary as his burning of the papal bull and of canon law. Both actions were public affirmations of reform um, toward the idea of, uh, of education. All right. Um, the rest of this paragraph goes ahead and develops the idea. Um, the revolutionary implications were clear to his contemporaries, for example. Da 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 da. It was popular and, you know, it sold out. It wasn't the first. So now we have another transition. Luther's translation of the Bible into German wasn't the first. Um, and so we're going on, all right, he's doing, he's making reforms. We know this is going to be how he makes reforms, and he is making a very influential translation of the Bible. And, but his was the most important. Their German was poor, and they were translations of the Vulgate, that is, translations of a translation. Luther is going back to the original, and he is working to make the Bible more accessible to the laity, um, you know, through translations. Um, and so here we've got the idea that um, he is, um, you know, really working, that this is something new, that the first step of the implementation of reform is making a set of biblical texts available to the laity. And even for things like failing eyesight, so they're able to work with, with that. And then, basically, all the rest of this is, you know, talking about, you know, it's expanding on what Luther is doing. Luther's sense of evangelical freedom was uh, evident in his concern to translate, not word for word, but sense for sense. The matter itself, as well as the nature of the language, demands us. Basically, this paragraph is, again, elaborating on why Luther is so focused on making this type of translation of the Bible. However, um, you know, so up until this point, this is what Luther is doing, but he's not the only one implementing reform. We see the next translation, during the next transition, during Luther's enforced sabbatical at the Wartburg, winds of confusion and pressure to implement reforms buffeted his colleagues in Wittenberg. Um, now this new theology should be enacted. But what do we do? Um, you know, how can this, uh, um, you know, what happens here? And so... Sorry, I'm still figuring this out. Um, and here is the Luther's um, disappeared. Here we come to the entire statement of the chapter, right here. Who will lead the reform of the church in his absence? Leadership logically fell on two of Luther's closest colleagues in the reform of the university, Philip Melanchthon and Andreas Bodenstein von Karlstadt. Both would soon be involved in the efforts to implement the new understanding of the gospel. But, as they picked their ways through the personal and political minefields of reform, it would be Karlstadt who would receive the ministerial equivalent of a battlefield commission. In other words, of these two individuals, it's going to be Karlstadt 
who's going to be the important guy. So basically, what we see here in just the first few paragraphs is the setup for the entire chapter. We know that people are going to start implementing reforms. Luther is holed up, and he's doing the academic work of reform, and this is revolutionary in and of itself, but it's going to be his friends on the ground in Wittenberg who are going to be dealing with the practical implementation of reform. Well, now what I do, I've talked it through, and by the way, do you notice where I was looking, you know, with these little uh, things, I'm always at the beginning and the end of the chapter, and occasionally middle toward the beginning or middle toward the end. Um, if I were going to uh, be going on next, what I would do would be, I would, um, once I remember how to, uh, to change this around, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to look all the way at the end. And so I'm going to skip through, and there's a bunch of pages that aren't there, but the ending is, which is one reason I chose this, uh, this chapter. And when we uh, scroll all the way up to page 106, um, we're going to see that um, what uh, the end of the essay is will indeed um, suspect... Pages 105 to 106 are not shown in this preview. Huh, they were when I checked this out. Oh, well. Um, basically, um, we know that there are going just from this little bit. <clears throat> and so Luther came to identify with St. Paul and embraced the view that those who differed from him were like those who had differed from St. Paul, false brethren. Okay, that tells us that we're not just looking for how the reforms were being implemented, but that tells us that Karlstadt is basically going to piss Luther off, that um, Karlstadt is going to be implementing reforms, and that Luther is not going to agree with them, and that therefore there's going to be a rupture, a break between Karlstadt and Luther. Okay, well, we know where this chapter's going. Change over time, implementation of reform. Now let's take a look at trying to make sense out of this, um, you know, out of this uh, um, piece. I'm trying to get to where I can actually move things around and not just the browser. Um, there we go. So I'm going to go back to a new to the next section. So we know that we're going to be looking at the implementation of reforms in Wittenberg, so, and that there's going to be a real problem. Um, just offhand, while I'm doing this slow scrolling, um, you know, people don't put in section headings um, just for the fun of it. Um, they put them in because they need to give you a sense of where the section is going. And so here we have a section on Melanchthon, the teacher of Germany. And so remember that um, just above, Lindbergh has said that it's going to be Karlstadt, it's going to be important, but that uh, Melanchthon has actually helped. Um, and so here we've got um, the, uh, a section. So this is who he is. And then you get a paragraph on this is, uh, um, you know, what, uh, where he is. He's at the same uh, university as Luther. And most importantly, Luther became impatient with his cautiousness, his so-called pussyfooting, and times when he was upset by Luther's rages, their personality differences did not separate them. So in other words, we've got a section on Philip Melanchthon, and he's basically, you know, okay, he's pretty much like Luther. There's not going to be a problem. However, the same cannot be said for Karlstadt. Karlstadt and Proto-Puritanism. 
All right, so we've got one section. All you need to take away from that, Melanchthon is a colleague. He's like Luther. When they're different, they don't clash. Karlstadt is a different animal, and it's going to have to do with something called proto-Puritanism. All right. Um, now, a historian who knows religious history, that's going to tell you a lot right there, but um, for people who are just encountering this for the first time, not so much. So you're wondering, okay, whatever proto-Puritanism is, it is the clash between these two men. So we start off, as we did before, with a bit of a yeah, biography. And he is, um, you know, he seems to be doing pretty well. Um, and so he's, you know, contrived to leave. He's uh, into, the, uh, into the Reformation. He's got his doctorates. And, but, you know, skipping down, I don't even have to read that. I can go to my next um, the last couple of sentences. Perhaps too much should not be made of this since faculties are renowned for petty jealousies, but it does seem that Karlstadt did not relate well to his colleagues. He has been described as a volatile, exasperating, scheming, fiery-tempered man suffering from an inferiority context. It has been suggested that his later falling out with uh, Luther had elements of sibling rivalry. All right, so in other words, this guy is the kind of guy that is always going to be trying to one-up you, is always feeling as if he's not good enough, so he's got to work five times as hard, but not to build you up to. So he's difficult to begin with. Some scholars have argued, okay, some scholars have argued, um, Lindbergh is giving you an alternative view that the conflict that developed between Karlstadt and Luther was rooted in differences over strategies and tactics over the pace of the Reformation, how fast it's going to be, the direction of reform in Wittenberg, well, you know, what we're going to do first, and Luther's insistence on personal ownership of the reform movements. Um, Lindbergh then qualifies that. Okay, that's all well and good, these pertinent observations, so the, those views are not wrong, but they should not obscure, they shouldn't hide the theological differences between the two men. Um, basically, what we see here is that um, Luther is, uh, there are fundamental differences, and it's not just because of Karlstadt's temper, and it's not just because Luther is a bit jealous and wants to direct the whole thing himself. In other words, you have two, um, you know, alpha dogs snarling over this Reformation bone. Um, but um, why do we need to know that? Last sentence here. Already the Reformation initiated by Luther had become the Reformations. There are two different visions of what the Reformation should be. The application of this interpretation to the story of the Reform Movement in Wittenberg requires a brief excursus into Karlstadt's theology and its difference from Luther's. So here Lindbergh is telling you, okay, first of all, at the beginning I told you that there were going to be arguments over the pace of reform. Luther's out of the picture. His lieutenants are out there working. Now, Melanchthon we can dispose of because no matter how different they get, they fundamentally get along and work with each other. But Karlstadt is a different animal altogether. Karlstadt's going to be the one that becomes the most important, and he becomes the most important not just because he's an overbearing git, but because he has a fundamental difference of a theology from Luther, and that this is going to make for two separate approaches to Reformation, and that before we can understand that, we have to understand what Karlstadt's theology was and how it differs from Luther. You see how he's telling you where he's going, but notice that I'm not focusing on the beginning or on the middle of the chapter of the uh, paragraph. I'm always focused on those transitions for the why it matters. And so the next few uh, 
um, few sections are going to be about Karlstadt's theology. And I could go ahead and uh, go through it, but, you know, some of it is indeed uh, missing. But if I were, you know, trying to get a handle on it, and I'm thinking, God, theology, when did I want to, I didn't want this to be a religion class, and I would, again, be going through beginning and the end of paragraphs. Clerical marriage is a hot button. Um, you know, um, hello, there we go. Um, there's Luther's view, then there's something, uh, visit, then um, there's a lively debate, and there's Karlstadt's view, and so basically there's going to be um, we're going to be talking about marriage as a way of illustrating bigger differences between these guys. So, and in fact, Karl Stott goes ahead with it. He not only talks about clerical marriage, a cleric, by the way, is like a, is a member of the church. It can be anyone from a person who is a scribe but who has taken minor orders to a priest. Karl Stott's actually a priest, and he gets married. Ooh, the horror. At any rate, so we're going to go through and go through, you know, clerical marriage is popular with the laity, but then I'm going to skip forward. Eventually, Luther gets married, and then we've got, and one of the things that's bad with this uh, Google Books preview is that we've actually missed a um, the end of a section, which would be the end of the clerical marriage issue and the transition to, well, why does it matter for Luther and Karlstadt, namely that Luther himself gets pushed into getting married. He marries a woman named Katharina, who is uh, also known as Katie. So basically, what I would be doing looking through this chapter is going um, first, Beginning and end. You saw how I set it up. This is where this text is going. Next, I'm talking about, okay, well, we've got this argument between these two, uh, two men. And you know from the beginning that all of that stuff about the argument is going to set up to why Karlstadt becomes the most important figure in pushing the Reformation forward. And from then on, you're looking for issues. How did they differ from each other and on what grounds? They differed on marriage. They differed on speed. Um, how fast should the Reformation go? They differed on a whole host of, of things. Finally, what you're looking for is an ability to sit up from your reading and say to your child, your dog, your cat, your husband, your wife, um, whoever, yourself, Whoever is there, okay, from what I understand from chapter 4, and you would be able to say there were, you know, three specific places where Luther differed from his followers, especially Andreas Karlstadt. The most important one was in the basic theology, um, and you'd explain that. Um, the second most important one was in the speed of reform. Um, finally, the third was in a simple personality clash. As a result, the implementation of reform at Wittenberg did not necessarily follow Luther's plan, and on top of that, it spawned a whole host of views about what the Reformation should be. Notice that we've gotten that without reading, you know, two-thirds of what was in the chapter, okay? We've looked at the beginning, we've looked at the end, we've figured out where we're going, and then we start looking for how the argument works. I hope this has made sense and has helped you with your reading. If you need to, give me a call during my office hours, Monday from 2 to 5.30 and Thursday from 2 to 5.30. Have your book ready 
and let's go over a chapter with you. I'll make you make sense out of it. Um, please don't call right at 5.30 because I have other obligations immediately after office hours and I'm not going to be able to sit down with you. Give us at least half an hour to 40 minutes to go over this material. But definitely call if you're confused or having trouble reading because dollars to donuts, it's not you. Trust me, they do not let stupid people into Mercer. Um, the most likely thing is that it is your reading strategy, and that's fixable with practice. Second most likely thing, your vocabulary level. That's also fixable. Get yourself a book of Greek and Latin roots, put it in the bathroom, look at one page every day. Um, if you know that anti is against, for example, A-N-T-I, and um, let's see... Um, oh, uh, you know, you'd know that antigen is something that is against, it's something that you use to, you know, to help against, uh, um, biological, uh, issues. Um, you would know, um, that, uh, antipathy, um, is something that you don't like, um, you have an antipathy toward reading Lindbergh, you really don't like it. Um, or, you know, things like that. If you know that bellum is war and anti with an E is before, A-N-T-E, you know that antebellum is before the war. Um, you know that post is after. Um, your posterior is, the, uh, is your rump. It is after your face. Um, then postbellum is after the war. At any rate, as I've said, hope this helps. Call me if you need help. Bye.